Hey everybody, I don't know about you, but as you've watched out over the world, the war in uh, Russia and Ukraine is not just isolated to Eastern Europe. It's spread all over the world and you can see it in market instabilities. You can see it here. People who do not think that that war is affecting you, all you got to do is look at gas prices. You look at uh, your food prices. You see the, the global uh, change that has happened. But you know something that's also affected investments as well. And I've said all along, Legacy Precious Metals is your navigator. They're the ones that see you through to get to the next level. The good news about this is even with market volatility, market instability, you've got uh, options. And gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold. And gold presents a hedge against this inflation and that protects you uh, against the weakening dollar, which we are seeing. Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust to deal with gold and silver and the other precious metals. You need this investment. You need this as part of your portfolio to keep you buffered from what we're seeing in the world. War and, and, and volatility in the market. This is where you need to be. Uh, call Legacy Precious Metals today. Uh, be proactive about this. Get on board with it. Call them at 866-528-1900. 0386-528-1903, or you can download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com, your navigator in a volatile world of investments. Do you want to listen to a podcast? By who? Georgia GOP Congressman Doug Collins. How, how is it? The greatest thing I have ever heard in my whole life. I could not believe my ears. In this house, wherever the rules are disregarded, chaos and mob rule. It has been said today, where is bravery? I'll tell you where bravery is found and courage is found. It's found in this minority who has lived through the last year of nothing but rules being broken, people being put down, questions not being answered, and this majority say, be damned with anything else. We're going to impeach and do whatever we want to do. Why? Because we won an election. I guarantee you, one day you'll be back in the minority and it ain't going to be that fun. Uh, folks, uh, you, uh, a good you know, Mike Johnson, your Louisiana congressman, you are a absolute rock star as far as the Constitution and, and, and doing what's right. And I think that's been a great thing. So as we, you know, as we get into this discussion, you know, one of the things I just want to start off, it sort of broke re very recently. I just find it hard to believe, and, and it's going to lead me to speculation, that the Supreme Court couldn't really figure out who leaked the document, which lends to tell me it possibly could have been an actual Supreme Court justice that they were just didn't want to go there. Yeah, we've been awaiting the outcome of this internal investigation for a long time, as you know, and we were so deeply disappointed yesterday with the supposed outcome. Now, the problem is that the, the person in charge of investigating this inside the institution is the Supreme Court marshal. That is not an, an investigatory uh, <laughs> agency or, you know, they, they don't have the, the depth or the knowledge or the expertise to do it. And so we don't know what stones have yet been unturned. You know, I mean, did they did they use polygraphs? Did they question the liberal justices themselves or was it just the law clerk? Somebody's not telling the truth here. And so that means, Doug, of course, the culprit is still at large. And this is a huge threat to the institution. Now, in that 20 page report that came out yesterday, um, the marshal's report, you know, the official document that's floating around, they they acknowledged in there that Congress needs to take action and Congress needs to step in and make sure that this is a federal crime, because shockingly, it's not uh, to this point it, current under current law. It's not now la in the last Congress, Doug, you'll be interested in this. I filed the Leaker Accountability Act and we would make it a felony punishable uh, uh, up to five years in prison. If anybody leaks confidential information or or uh, draft court opinions uh, early in the future and uh, of course nancy pelosi wouldn't put it on the floor you know how that goes but we're filing it again this morning that's some breaking news for you we'll break it on, on uh and and i, I think it's going to have a great chance of passage we've got to do something and even the marshal uh, the marshal's office itself has now uh, endorsed it effectively in their report. Well, I, and I like the, the, the situation. Now, you know, you and I both are, uh, are sworn into the Supreme Court bar. We both have that. The marshal's job is mainly to get us to our seats, make sure everybody's taking place and make sure everything is safe. It's not to investigate something that, you know, again, you know, and, and look, I want to also be open and fair here. It doesn't matter who leaked it. And, you know, and I've heard the, you know, the perspective, you know, we, we assume it to be liberal. But it could have been conservative. I mean, it could have been, you know, and, and I hate that. I mean, OK, this hit me something. Mike. You and I talk a lot about it. Does it bother you that we talk about Supreme Court justice now in those terms? Because I, ju I just used it myself. 
you know, we have the liberal, we have the conservative, we have the swing. It, doesn't that from a from a layman perspective out here, you know, who's this envisioned law is blind, you know, justice, the scales of justice is blind. Does that not bother you a little bit? It, it does bother me, you know, and, and, and you're right. You and I have talked about this a lot because this is something that's a, a, a common part of my speeches when I talk to large audiences and in any group I'm in, Doug, especially somebody like you. We served on the Judiciary Committee together and you were such a great chair of that. We've always been concerned about maintaining the faith in our institutions and, and arguably the most important institution we have in this constitutional republic, still an experiment on the world stage, is our system of justice. There has to be a belief among the people. If you're gonna have a government of, by, and for the people, as Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address, um, then, then one of the things you have to maintain is the people's faith in that system, that, that, that it is, as you said, that it, justice is blind, that we have equal justice under law, the words that are chiseled into the marble above the door of the Supreme Court. And we're gradually losing that here. The, the, the Supreme Court is being viewed uh, more and more as just another political branch, another arm of whichever party is in power. And, and that's a serious threat in a, in a system of government like ours, because if the people lose their faith in the, the, the equality of justice, the system of justice itself, then we lose a very important element of what allows us to maintain order. You know, if, if people don't believe the system is fair and that justice is blind and that they can rely upon that system, then what happens is they want to dis resolve their disputes in the streets. And, and that leads to chaos and anarchy, and we just can't have it. So, I, you know, that's a long answer to a really important question you've asked, and, and it does bother all of us. Well, it should. Well, and I'm on, I'm going to step here and I'm not going to look, there's a lot of reasons for people to be frustrated with our election system and something I've been saying for years. And I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat, when you it, it fix what's broken, but don't attack the very institution, because that's the part that, that this concerns me. We need to fix and read out and hold accountable anybody who, you know, does something wrong with our ballot boxes, our machines, whatever. But, you know, Mike, how many times have you heard it in the last little bit where we have people saying, I don't want to vote because I don't trust my I don't trust my votes going to be counted. That's been what's held us together for 250 years is that fact that no matter what may happen. In Louisiana and Georgia, we have our histories, you know, oh, yeah. it's, it's oh, yeah. still something we said, okay, at the end of the day, we'll make it better and go forward. You know, that's exactly right. Among those sacred institutions and the things that the people have to have faith in is the, the, the sanctity of that election, the ballot box, you know, the security of that. And when election security has been questioned as it has in, in, in the last couple of years, because of all these unprecedented events that have taken place, um, that's a real threat. And you're right, Georgia, I mean, has been at the tip of the spear of that. We've all watched and prayed for you guys as you navigated through it, um, you know, and, and hats off to the, you know, uh, Governor Kemp and the others who really put the act to the grind and try to fix that. The legislature stepped in and tried to clean up some of those problems and they, they've done a yeoman's job, but apparently we still have a long way to go and we certainly do in, in several of the other states. And so we have to keep that as a top priority. And I hear it all the time, Doug, when I'm out doing town halls and, and, you know, meeting with my constituents in my district, this is one of the first two or three questions that pops up still to this day. What about election integrity? And it's a real concern for us. Well, and, and, and look, and I'm not, you know, I'm not about a what about ism, but this has been building for 22 years now, Florida, yeah. you know, 22 and 2000. And then for, for really no reason except we don't like the results. And this is what's, you know, the mainstream media forgets all the time. It was in, you know, 2004, 2000, you know, 2000, 2004. Then we get back. The Democrats were the very first ones to, you know, really start this modern day objection on the floor uh, as we go forward. And so look, <laughs> yeah, it, look, it, we get into that, but I mean, but it goes back to the heart of what we got started to with the Supreme Court. And that's just this inherent institutional, uh, trust that you can go there and that the, the least of the least, you know, it can go there and get a fair hearing and, and, right. and not, it not be five, four to start with it, not be six, three to start with it's, Hey, here's a case. We're going to hear the case and we're going to apply the law to it. And, right. and I think that is, you know, that is a concern and it, from criminal law to business law to, to everything else. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, something that I think is more and more, you know, concerning, especially when you're having criminal justice across the country questioned because of people not enforcing the law. Right. I mean, the, of course, the, the DAs uh, are elected in most jurisdictions by the people, all of them almost. And you've had people like George Soros, the big, you know, radical leftist, uh, anarchist, uh, socialist, whatever, however you want to describe him. He goes by many uh, descriptors, but 
Um, he's a, a big, big wealthy donor outside the country who has invested in local district attorney races. And when that started happening a few years ago, we all scratched our heads and said, what is he up to? Well, now it's obvious they elected uh, people who are not just soft on crime. They, they, they're not interested in prosecuting crime at all. And then that's why we have unprecedented rates of, of murder and mayhem in most of American cities, certainly all the ones that are running. And I'm, that's not a it sounds like hyperbole. It's not a political statement. That is the truth of the matter. By any objective analysis of the data, that's what it shows. Look, in, in New Orleans, here in my state of Louisiana, that's five hours away from me. I'm in the north uh, west Louisiana, north corner of it. Um, but but New Orleans has a murder rate that is just it, it's it's inconceivable. In the first 18 days of this year, they had a murder every single day. We we're averaging a murder a day in New Orleans. And so, of course, it affects the economy. It affects tourism. It affects, you know, we're coming up on the Mardi Gras season, which would normally attract, you know, over a million visitors to the city. People are wary to go and walk around the French Quarter. They should be because, um, you know, carjackings are, are often, they've had over 400 carjackings since January 1st. I mean, because the crime is not being prosecuted, the criminals know that. And so it opens the door for more mayhem. And, and, and it just defies common sense. It defies reason and it endangers the public. But you have political operatives elected as district attorneys who do not care about the victims of crime. They're on the side of the criminals. And I just think that that is just unconscionable. And, and it's going to take another round of elections for people to wake up and realize we can't have that. Well, I think you're saying it for those who seem like an eternity ago for me. I actually did my master's in divinity at uh, New Orleans Baptist Theological down on yeah. Gentilly. And I remember at the time then there was you know a lot of questions because that was at a time when uh, the Catholic priest was shot walking his dog. Mm. And um, it was just terrible. But here's and, and, and I'm going to but I'm going to turn this because what we just outlined and you've outlined very well is the anomaly. That's not the way it should be. Criminal justice reform, as it truly should be means public safety is taken care of, that the criminal is held accountable, and then we make ways for them to come out of that criminal lifestyle and, and, and say, how can you get back to being a a, a, a logical thinking you know, and have the opportunity to come back to a society instead of being on the criminal element of it? And so, you know, First Step Act, things that we worked on and everything else has been really just turned on its head by this kind of, frankly, stupidity that we're, that we're seeing, and it's made it very difficult and it's actually what kills me about this, Mike, is it actually hurts the very people that they claim to be helping. Oh, it course. actually it terrorizes the neighborhoods in which we're actually trying to help. Well, that's exactly right, because the people that have the means, of course, flee the cities. They, it's, there's a mass exodus and they go out to the suburbs or the rural areas and build fancy homes and surround them security guards and gates or whatever. And they, they live in gated communities. And wait, wait, walls work, Mike? Wait, hang <laughs> yeah, on a second. Wait, a, wait, walls work? What hang a on. concept, right? <laughs> Soccer. Um, but it is, it, you, you know, Doug, you're right. It's a great tragedy because the people that are hurt the most, the folks who are effectively trapped economically inside of these criminal zones, and uh, they don't have the, the ability, they're not mobile, and they can't get out like some of the others. And so it hurts the very communities that it's, de that it's designed supposedly to help. And, and, of course, it breeds more crime. And crime progressively becomes more and more violent and dangerous. And that's what you're seeing in these cities. And, and it's, it's not a sustainable situation, obviously, but it, it requires the people. Remember that government of, by, and for the people to stand up, to run, uh, you know, district attorneys and get behind persons who run for these local offices and prosecutors who actually care about uh, public safety. And, and I think I'm, I'm optimistic that we can turn the tide to get back to that. But it, it's a long process when this when this happens like it has. Well, it's going to take a while. And, and, and look, you know, prosecutors need to be fair as well. I mean, we have a history, you sure. know, prosecutors, you had a history of overcharging and plea deals and, you know, look, but, it, but it's a balance. We got to get back to that balance. But, but, you know, it, I think this opens up an opportunity, Mike, and I know your heart, you mentioned the, the, the March for Life and is in, in the whole issue around life, which you and I share uh, greatly. But also, I think it's time for conservatives. This is an opportunity. I always look at these things as, you know, this swinging. It's a time for conservatives to actually show that we are, as you talk about the people, that we actually care about people. We may disagree with your political beliefs, your social beliefs, whatever, but we care about people because conservatives actually do believe, you know, inherently by God that you were gifted with life from him. And, and right. if that is true, then how our programs and our policies ranging from, you know, school choice, education policy, you know, criminal justice reform, you know, things that actually put things back in the community. How can we help our 
colleagues understand that that is our, you know, that is the better position, not only for policy, but for people, instead of us all of a sudden going off on the other end and just say, lock everybody up and throw away the key, which is, you know, Angola is, is a, I mean, there's a lot of places where we show it just really don't work. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it's something that has, has burdened me for years. In fact, just yesterday, Doug, some more breaking news for you. I was, I was on the, on the, uh, I had a Zoom call with a publisher and I'm about to come out with, with my first book and it's called The Seven Core Principles of American Conservatism. And, um, we think we can get that out, uh, right. early spring. And, and it's birthed out of necessity because exactly what you just said, many on our side, many conservatives today are having a difficult time articulating and making the case for why our worldview and our principles are better for all people individually, you know, as individuals, as communities, as a state, as a nation, we believe that the pursuit is ultimately for human flourishing. And how do you accomplish that? Well, you stand for ideals, certainly individual freedom and limited government and, and the rule, things like peace through strength and fiscal responsibility and free markets. But ultimately, it's about human dignity, right? And the, and the genesis of that core is exactly what you just said. The reason that we march for life, and, and today is the 50th anniversary of the, of the March for Life, the first one, by the way, in a post row world, right? Which is such a critical thing in the celebration. Doug, I was born January 30th, 1972. So I'm exactly 358 days older than Roe v. Wade. And I'm so <laughs> grateful I outlived that barbaric decision. But the reason we march for life and the reason that conservatives stand so strongly for the sanctity of human life is exactly the same reason that it was articulated as our first inalienable right in the nation's birth certificate, the declaration, when Jefferson wrote it, he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, created by God, and they're endowed with certain inalienable rights that among those are the rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But life is listed first. Why? Because the founders understood most of them were seminary graduates like you, right? With 52 of the 56 signers had seminary degrees, right? They studied scripture. They understood that we're not created by the state. We don't get our rights from the state, from the government. We get our rights from God, our creator. And because of that, they understood that every single person is made in the image of God. And because of that, we have inherent dignity and value. And our value is not related in any way to the color of our skin or what zip code we live in or how intelligent we are or where we went to school. It, it's, it's irrelevant. Your, your value is inherent because it is given to you by your creator. And because of that, our public policy should uh, be enacted in a way that allows for the flourishing of the individual, that allows for the freedom to pursue uh, liberty and happiness and to have the opportunity to do that. And the criminal justice system is a part of that. It has to be fair. It has to be equal. You have to have law and order. You have to have the rule of law, but you have to, you have to also, also have an eye towards redemption. And, you know, Micah 6, 8 is a scripture passage you and I both know well and talk about all the time. He has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord requires you to act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Those first two admonitions are not mutually exclusive. We can act justly and love mercy. The balance there is what we're trying to is what we're trying to achieve. And in a, in a constitutional republic, we have the best uh, opportunity to do that. But it takes hard work, it takes thoughtful people, and it takes a commitment to those principles that I think largely we've lost in recent years. Well, I, I can't wait to see the book. Once the book comes out, we'll have you back on and, and let's talk about the book. I'm looking forward to that. But but you've also Thanks. made a uh, and, and we're not we're not going to preach here this morning, but we are going to do a little exegesis, if you would. We're going we can't do, help we, but preach. We uh, can't uh, help but <laughs> preach. Doctor. We're going to dissect. We're going to dissect that that what you just said because it is it's 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 the, it's the justice mercy part. People, yeah. there's becoming more and more of this idea that you can't be could do justice uh, and and have mercy. And, or uh, vice versa, you can't be merciful and do justice. The very oxymoron of the Christian faith, that we are held accountable for sin, but offered hope through that atonement. I mean, it, it's right. I, I, like I said, so I get very frustrated. This is a passion project for me. I'm, I, I'm in my... <laughs> it's sort of funny you talk about books. I'm I'm in that mode right now of my getting my second one, and it's like I, I'm gone between these episodes of where do I really want to hit here? Because I yeah. see it in our faith groups, I see it in our in our churches, I see it in our and and and, and as I've grown, I, I, have you ever heard the quote from uh, Twain? It said, "It's not the parts of the Bible that I." Uh, don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, right. Exactly. So, you know, it's called so conviction. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like, oh, I should have been doing that. Uh, anyway, well, I mean, we could go for days on that one, but it, it is, it is, but I think it's inherent because it goes back. 
really to the foundational structures, that institutional question that we started this whole thing off with, is our institutions were based on an inherent form of trust. Not that we all agreed. I mean, there's this false narrative out there that we're all on the same page. We can't. We didn't always agree. I mean, just look at the elections and, and uh, back then. But the bigger picture was the the humanity, the the people, the the idea that there was freedom in that as we go forward. Speaking of freedom, you're back. Uh, Judiciary committee is getting ready to um, mm-hmm. you know get back started and, and, and go. What what do you see happening? And and because we've talked about it before, I, I'm a firm believer it can't be just the investigations. There has to be some other things as well. How do you see uh, Chairman Jordan and others, you know, y'all playing this out? Uh, great question. This is developing as we speak. Um, I'll, 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 one more breaking news item for you, Doug. Since you're um, so last night, Kevin McCarthy, our friend Kevin, the speaker now, uh, called me and asked me to serve on this new select committee. And this is a select subcommittee under judiciary on the weaponization of the federal government. And everybody's heard a lot about this. I think the official roster of who will be serving on that will come out uh, maybe today or probably Monday. Jim Jordan is going to chair that one as well. And so I'll be helping with both. So Jim will be both the chair of judiciary and the select committee, and both will have a a huge and full agenda. Um, On the oversight kind of in that category, the things that we have to correct, and look into and investigate, bring bring accountability, bring justice, secure justice, um, is is you know in, in the the jurisdiction of judiciary, which you uh, were such an able chairman of that. Um, it's very broad, right? So we have jurisdiction over the Department of Justice itself and its agencies, like the FBI. Um, we have jurisdiction over immigration. We have um, jurisdiction over you know big tech and all the problems there. That you did a lot of early work trying to figure that one out. Um, all those issues are upon us. And in each one of those categories, there have been unprecedented breaches of public trust. And so we have to spend some time on that because, as you know, you know, our, our, our committee specifically in Congress uh, in a larger scope has the constitutional responsibility to ensure that, to make sure that the agencies of the executive branch of the federal government don't run amok on the people. And that's exactly what's been happening. So um, we'll be spending some time on that. We do have a legislative agenda. I mean, on immigration alone, for goodness sakes, we've got to solve the problem and close the border. Um, one of the investigations we'll be doing is of Secretary Mayorkas of the Department of Homeland Security, who I believe has committed impeachable offenses, Doug. And by the way, if any impeachment happens of any Biden official, it again comes through judiciary as we developed our expertise when you were at the helm. Um, so uh, we'll see how all that shakes out. In the middle of all that, though, we have sound legislative policy and agenda items that we need to push through. Um, it, it's, you know, the reality is numbers, it's a math game, right? Because we have a very slim majority in the House, as you know, will be four, as, as of today, it's four seats, Republican majority. So we got to keep that team together. And then assuming that we can on some of these big items, we're going to hit a brick wall in the Senate. Chuck Schumer has said, it's a no go. Whatever the basically, he's, he's basically said whatever the House Republicans pass, we're not touching it. So we're going to have to. You got to get sixty votes in the Senate to advance substantive legislation. So that's a hurdle. And then assuming we could get through it, you know, the chance of Joe Biden signing one of our initiatives is pretty small. So we. we Um, that's that's where we are, and, and we'll be working every day to pursue those ends and, and show the American people that we're there to work. We're rolling our sleeves up, and it started already. Well, and I think that's and that's really important as we look at this going along. Um, one of the things is, and, and I, I've said this, I'm not imparting it upon you or anything else, though, but you know, as much as we had to do with FBI, DOJ, and everything else, I, I just have not seen Chris Ray get better. And, and we talk about Mayorkas, and Mayorkas is you know a, a special you know, individual unto himself. I mean, he just talked about completely, you know, disregard your job. I mean, that's my orcas. But how can we get it through to Ray? Or is it possible anymore that, hey, your time's passed. This is not working. Democrats and Republicans don't understand this. I mean, when you got the document issue, you've got, you know, Department of Justice, when they don't even, when they, again, it's just, is there any way there, are we just stuck with him for, a few more years because he just seemingly is not going to move. Uh, well, y- y- I know you saw this, but a- about uh, about a- a three weeks before the election in November uh, or late October, early November, sometime in there, we, we issued a 1,000 page report documenting our deep concerns about the current state of the FBI. 
And of course, Director Ray is in charge of all this, so it falls on his watch. And um, we had had whistleblowers, uh, over a dozen come forward inside the FBI to uh, tell the story of the corruption, the rife corruption at the very top of the agency. And it, it is a huge uh, crisis for the country because the FBI is the top you know, law enforcement and investigation agency in the country. Um, but, but look what they've done just over the last two years under the Biden administration. They, they've used counterterrorism resources against school parents who showed up at school board meetings to protest curricula. They raided the homes of their political opponents. They did the raid on Mar-a-Lago over classified documents while they're you know, applying a completely different standard to Joe Biden right now as we speak. Uh, they targeted conservative states over their uh, election integrity laws. They inflated uh, domestic extremism statistics. Um, they, they helped institute illegal vaccine mandates, just to name a few abuses. And so, so many of those things have made the American people doubt the fairness, uh, the, the, the integrity of the FBI itself. And so there, there are few problems greater than that in the country. We have to get that straight. And, and it's going to require some accountability from the very top and, and probably a leadership change. And it, it, the Congress may have to force it somehow. So this is going to be one of the big struggles ahead of us. I can say that. Well, one of the things that bothers me, and we're talking about the documents here for just a second. Look, and I, and I, I was on, it was interesting enough, I was on a panel with Alan Dershowitz. And uh, I don't know if you remember Mike Grimm. Mike was a former member before you got there. It was an FBI agent, but anyway, yeah. issues yeah. there. But he had left. Anyway, Mike and I were on this uh, interview, and Dershowitz kept coming back saying, neither one of them are going to be charged. He's talking about Trump and Biden, and this is really irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. And I said, whoa, 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 Alan, I, I appreciate you. I mean, I like, I appreciate your opinion. I said, but people are charged with this every day. Military lives are ruined. Yep. Careers are ruined at FBI. There's other places where they handle these documents, even inadvertently. Right. You know? So, I mean, these are the kind of issues that, that we have to deal with. But one thing came up in the last couple of days, and, and if this is true, then I would, I don't know how you would bring this out because they'll never agree to come talk about it. But, it seems like CBS and others knew about this. We're now hearing that there are people in the White House who knew about this when it was actually going on on November 2nd, right. possibly even DOJ knowing about this before, you know, definitely knowing about it, but saying, we'll just let it leak out later. That to me Huge. is worse than the offense. Huge. That's worse than the offense. Absolutely. And, and we've got to, and we've got to, I mean, it's interesting to me because I know, a former investigative reporter who used to do a lot of good work. I haven't followed her as close to Catherine Heritage is used to is now at CBS. And it's like, how has she let this pass? I mean, how would how did they you know? And I'm not saying she was in part of it, but I'm saying there's some good investigative reporters at CBS. How do you just give them a pass on this six days before the election or even two days after the election? It doesn't matter when they found it's it. astounding and inexcusable. And I think you're right. That's the biggest immediate issue in the whole scandal. Uh, all the interviews I've done over the last, uh, you know, several days, I pointed that out. I was on with Neil Cavuto and he said, why does it really matter? I said, well, it ma the timeline is so important because if they knew about it on November 2nd, of course, the fateful election day was November 8th. It was, they had it a week before the election. And remember what was so relevant. You know, so many things happen in the news cycle these days. We lose we lose track of oh, time, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that seems like a, a 10 years ago. But in the in the first week of November and right before this, these documents were discovered at the at the Biden think tank office and then later at his home, they were beating the snot out of Donald Trump after they had raided Mar-a-Lago for the exact same infraction. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So that would have been an explosive piece of information, an explosive breaking news headline. And they buried it until just last week, right? I mean, not even not even in the days or weeks after the election. They waited until the the new year. In fact, I think that this is important. And not, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, Doug, but you got to look deeply into this. And I don't trust anybody involved. But you know, it, it, it's curious that right after the the election of the Republican Speaker of the House, right after Kevin secured the votes to become the Speaker. That's when this broke, right when Jim Jordan and I and others are composing the select committee on the weaponization of government and setting up our Judiciary Committee panels. That's when they break it. Hmm. You know, that timing seems curious. Here's the other thing, and you'll understand this more than more than most. Um, I immediately texted Jim and I said, Jim Jordan, I said, Jim, this this stinks to high heaven. The timing, really? Oh, so now they're going to now now um, Merrick Garland, the, the hopelessly corrupt attorney general, immediately launches into action and 
and names a special counsel over the, the Biden classified <laughs> document. Why? Because you and I both know what happens when a special counsel gets involved. Anything that touches that investigation is now suddenly off limits for congressional investigation. Oh, well, what's curious about this? Hunter Biden is one of the people who listed as a residence the location where classified documents were mishandled and kept in the garage next to the Corvette and in other rooms in the house. OK, so now it's not a stretch of the imagination to assume that the Department of Justice, the Biden Department of Justice and Merrick Garland are going to say in response to our subpoenas and requests for documents, gosh, gee, guys, we'd love to turn over all that information about China, Ukraine, Iran, Hunter Biden's contracts and dealings with them, how the big guy, Joe Biden himself, financially benefited from it. Gosh, but we just can't turn them over to you now. You know why? Because it's subject to a special counsel investigation. Ah, gee whiz. And, and that's going to last us a while. And so I know your select committee on weaponization has a two year window to the end of the Congress. And you know what? We'll get back to you in about three years on that. You know, I mean, th that's what we're expecting to happen. And this just makes the corruption look even worse. But that timetable, as you said, that was the key to the whole thing. Well, the time to, but then, the, but then there's one other question. And before we get off here, I think we've got to delve into it. These have been there now because now we're hearing that they're sort of throwing the, the vice president transition team under the bus a little bit. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do all this because they've been there for six years. So let's, let's don't forget this is not during the presidency. This has been out there for a long time. Um, I'm just curious. Why were they in his house? Why were <laughs> they looking in these documents? Why was lawyers in Joe Biden's house on November the 2nd? I, 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 okay, I know I'm slow from North Georgia. I get it, but we are two-time <laughs> national champions. We'll throw that in there. <laughs> Go Tigers. Go Tigers. <laughs> Go dogs, baby. Uh, but anyway, but, but I mean, do, I mean, when's the last, I mean, I'm still a part of a law firm. I got others. I know you have been as well. You ever thought about asking some of your colleagues to go look through your files just for no reason at all? No, and and my files aren't are top secret, classified, highly sensitive, <laughs> exactly. nuclear secrets, etc. Right, and and that's that's among the many questions that we have and cannot wait to delve into are, are those and the fact that you know the the big hubbub over the last twenty four hours or so has been about. Logs. We requested the visitor logs to the residence and the think tank where all these documents were haphazardly stored. And, uh, oh, gee whiz, they told us we don't have any visitor logs. Well, really? Oh, well, the, the, there is no such thing as a private residence for a sitting United States president. I mean, the Secret Service is all over the place. There's all sorts of security. There must be for a reason, because particularly if you have highly sensitive classified documents on the on location, the American people are entitled to know who was at that location. Now, Hunter Biden lived there during this time period of six years we're talking about at various points. By the way, you don't have to report rent anymore, Mike. I didn't know if you, I don't oh, know if you have yeah. rental properties. Particularly but you don't need to report 50, rent 000. anymore, undoubtedly. Yeah, right. yeah I mean, under 50000 just don't even report it it's anymore. Just, it's just incredible. <laughs> I, I, said on, I said on an interview on Fox News, Doug, I said, you know, if they don't have visitor logs, we're going to have to seek that information somewhere else. Actually, I was talking to Cabuto about this, and, and, and Neil said, in the interview, he goes, well, but but Congressman, why would you need to subpoena Biden family members, as you just said, because you would presume they'd be at the location. Why does it matter? I said, Neil, it matters because we want to know who accompanied them to the location. Who did Hunter Biden bring in as an overnight guest at this residence where classified documents are lying around? Right. This is very, very important, relative information for the American people to know. And and uh, the timeline matters who had access, why they were there, how they got there. What? How did this happen? It's just, it's just incredible. And the, and of course, the president, President Biden, his double standard is just on glaring display. And the media gives him a pass. But he said famously in the interview when when the Trump documents were first discovered, I can't believe how irresponsible. How could this possibly happen? And he was doing the exact same thing. You know, the the, the last point here, and 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 we'll sum up this uh, podcast is my theory is my is two things. Is he intentionally not remembering or does he honest to God not remember? Well, I mean, probably a combination I, of the two, I think. And, and and look, I'm not trying to be, cause there's a lot of things, you know, you, you, I mean, if I was to ask you, Hey, on this date, five years ago, what were you doing, Mike? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, can you refresh my memory? Even then I don't really remember, you know, but, but it does become, because his, his actions and so many other things lend way to the fact that he, he sort of is on this, you know, very much of a 
goldfish kind of mentality that, oh, I remember it now. And then five minutes later, I have no idea what we're talking about. And so I think it's, it's going to be tough as y'all get onto it. But I got no doubt you and others will take care of it. I look forward to seeing you in D.C. Uh, coming up. I want to uh, continue to, to do that. But we're going to get you back on. Let me know when the book gets ready. And uh, w- if we don't have you on before then, we'll definitely have you on when the, when the book drops. Okay. Fantastic. Keep up the great work. I love seeing you on the five and, and uh, love seeing Fox News make such good use of your talents and expertise, brother. Keep it up. I appreciate it, man. Everybody, Mike Johnson, Louisiana, follow this guy. Go to his Twitter. Go to his site. Follow him. If you follow him, I guarantee you'll be on the right track. We'll see you next time on the Doug Collins Podcast. Hey, folks. MyPillow is excited to bring to you their biggest bedding sale ever. For a limited time, you're going to get the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98, a set of pillowcases for only $9.98, and rejuvenate your bed with a MyPillow mattress topper for as low as $99.99. $99.99. Get a mattress pillow topper. Look, they come in all sizes. They got all kinds of stuff. Uh, blankets. They've got duvets. They've got quilts. they got comforts. they got body pillows. they got bolster pillows. they got all at big, big discounts. And also, they're extending their money-back guarantee for Christmas until March 1, 2023, making them the perfect gift for your friends, your family, and for everyone you know. Folks, and just from a personal note here, I have the Giza Dream Sheets. They're on my bed right now. I slept on them last night. Some of the best sheets that we and Lisa and I have ever owned. They are worth, I mean, at this price, they're a steal. My wife and I have bought bed sheets, linens at much higher cost. It's supposedly much higher quality. These from my pillow are at the highest of quality. And at a price like this, you can't beat it. So go now to mypillow.com, use promo code Collins, C O L L I N S or call 1-800-986-3994 and you'll get huge discounts on all the MyPillow bedding products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98 and get all your shopping done while qualities last. And remember, put in that promo code Collins for these discounts.